Hello and welcome to Payoff Pitch, the Action Network's Major League Baseball betting podcast presented by BetMGM. I'm Sean Zarillo, joined today by Anthony Dubondo to break down Tuesday's 15-game slate. We're also going to take a look at the futures markets, both in terms of team futures, teams to make and miss the playoffs, teams to win their respective divisions, or some player awards as well. You can hear Payoff Pitch every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday during Major League Baseball's regular season. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast and find us on Action Network's YouTube page. You can also see us on YouTube if you're tuning in there. We also greatly appreciate any five-star ratings you want to leave us. doesn't matter what you say in the review. doesn't matter if you're mean or if you're nice. As long as you leave us five stars, we do love them. So with that, let's get into Tuesday's slate. And we're going to briefly divert to futures and then finish up with some final bets. Let's go to best bets first. Anthony, normally don't see a prop as your best bet. And I'm curious why are you going with uh, Aaron Savali under five and a half strikeouts for your best bet today. Yeah, so I was thinking about using Baltimore. Uh, I like the Orioles today too, but Aaron Savali's numbers have been really interesting because since he joined the Rays, his profile has kind of changed a little bit. And that's not the first time we've seen that for a pitcher, but he's kind of been spamming fastballs uh, up in the zone more, a Rays specialty. And his strikeout rate last year especially really spiked uh, once he got traded from Cleveland to Tampa Bay. But if you look at his numbers this year, I think you're starting to see some regression back toward kind of what he's always been. So, you know, last season in Tampa, 45 innings, 11.5 strikeouts per nine. He was not that effective because he gave up more homers, which, you know, whatever, small sample homer rates are weird. But his XFIP was 3.26. Uh, his fit was 3.6, which were better than his Cleveland numbers, better than any number he's he's had in his entire career. So there was some optimism about Savali this year, uh, and I think it's warranted, and I think he is going to be uh, a pitcher that probably beats projections. Right now he has a 2-1 ERA. Obviously that flatters him, but uh, X fit right now 3.4, fit 4.1. I think he kind of settles into that 3.75 ERA range, which is you know about a quarter run better than most of the public projections. But – I think the projections are onto something when you look at his strikeout rate because it has seen a significant decline this year in whiff rate. Uh, teams are taking more first pitch strikes against Savali, but his swinging strike rate for his career is 9.8%. This season thus far, 8%. So that stabilizes pretty quickly, and it's much lower than it was in past seasons. Uh, and in the last season, in his partial time with the Rays, it was a career high 108 So you're seeing already a significant difference in the swinging strike rate. Now he is making up for it right now with called strikes, but he gets an angels team. That's pretty average in terms of taking first pitches and pretty average in terms of strikeout rate. They traditionally have had, you know, some pretty ugly lineups in the past, but right now, you know, with Ohapi and Sean, well, like it's not as bad of a strikeout lineup from LA as we're used to typically seeing. So uh, I think at five and a half, his total is a little high. I think he's going to be less than one strike out per inning guy. So uh, I like under five and a half at, at anything plus money. Yeah. There's no like super easy strikeouts in that lineup. Maybe Joe Adele in the past, he seems to be putting the bat on the ball potentially a little bit more this year. Joe, Joe Adele post, post, post type breakout potentially in 2024. I know that would make you very happy. Uh, my best bet today is the Detroit Tigers in both halves. I believe the first five line is moved closer to even money full game. I like it to plus one Oh five. I like it to plus one Oh five, either first five innings or full game. And, Casey Mize is a guy I've discussed before every start this season. He looked great in spring. And his fastball velocity creeped up even further. It was 94-9 in his first start, 96-7 in his last start. So already set a career high, pushed it even further. 122 stuff plus on the season. He ranks ninth amongst the 152 pitchers who have thrown at least five innings this season. He has four above average offerings per stuff plus. I've mentioned that he'll probably optimize his pitch mix further. He's throwing his slider, which is grades out as the worst of those four pitches, but is still a league average pitch most frequently among his secondary offerings. I think he's going to end up leaning on the splitter more frequently at some point. We'll see if that gets righties out in addition to lefties. But on the other end, John Gray stopped throwing his sweeper two years ago uh, in the middle of the 2023 or in the middle of last year, he was throwing a sweeper. In 2022, had great results, was throwing it for the first part of the 2023 season. Then he ended up scrapping it. And I'm wondering if it had something to do maybe causing biomechanical issues, arm issues. We talked about this with Corbin Burns this year, going away from a sweeper and back to a traditional slider. And the results on the pitcher substantially worse. The stuff plus has moved down from 
139 two years ago when he was throwing a sweeper to 79 on the slider this season. It was closer to league average last year, but he doesn't have any above average offerings now. And the fastball is getting lit up. He's had an expected slug on the fastball over 500 the past two seasons. All of his other secondary pitches are getting hit harder. So without a sweeper, John Gray seems like a significantly reduced pitcher. I project Casey Mize as the better pitcher. It's just tough for this Tigers lineup to score runs. They're not a fun team to watch. I love their pitching. They seem to have great pitching development, but their lineup is definitely lacking in bats. And it is difficult to put bets on them, knowing that they're probably only going to scrape across three or four runs at most. You're going to need to win low-scoring games with this Tigers staff. And Mize also, you know, the the results haven't necessarily translated, right, relative to the stuff ratings. He's only struck out a couple batters in that last start, but I think they will come for him at some point. Casey Mize, a guy I'm going to continue to bet on until I have evidence pointing otherwise. Any interest in the Tigers today for you? Yeah, I took some Mize over three and a half uh, strikeouts right. as well. Minus 110, best number available. He was the other guy that kind of jumped out at me. You mentioned it with the stuff numbers, taking a huge leap, the fastball velocity, there's almost no way for the strikeouts not to follow along closely yeah. with that. Uh, and I do think that, you know, hopefully he, you know, cross our fingers with injury risk, but so long as Mize is healthy, I think he's going to be a bet on guy uh, in this time. And I think you're going to see that, that strikeout market at three and a half. I mean, even if you think he's less than a strikeout per inning guy, which he probably still is, you know, 23, 24%, he's still going to project. He just has to go through the lineup twice uh, to get to that number. So I really Love the demise over three and a half um, in this one. Something I was thinking about last night too. It's, it sounds dumb, believe me, but it's actually like there might be something to it. I believe this is his third straight start that he's making in the afternoon. And when you just think about getting your body clock accustomed to like getting up at the right time, eating the same meal before the game, getting on the routine, I think there is like, you know, a very slight advantage there, whatever it is, like in terms of home field advantage that you would normally bake in for a team, just having the comfort of like doing the same thing over and over. I actually think there is kind of something to making his third consecutive start at the same time on the same body clock schedule. So nothing I factored into the line, but if it's worth half a percent, a percentage point in terms of making him better today, it certainly doesn't hurt. And just think it's interesting that he's managed to land on a day, three, three consecutive starts where he's pitching in the afternoon. Uh, let's move on to our favorite underdog for the day, a consensus underdog. We're both on the Oakland Athletics. I prefer them in the first five innings to about plus 108. Like them in the full game as well, though, to plus 116. I'll have a smaller bet for the full game than I will for the first five innings. But I was texting you during Dave Sears last start. This is a guy we've always liked. Always had a very aesthetically pleasing slider. It doesn't have like incredible stuff plus numbers, but the overall package from Sears this year is turning into a very solid pitcher. A sub three Bot ERA, projected ERA, based on his stuff, plus location, plus, and pitching plus ratings. He's throwing less four-seamers. He introduced the sinker. He's leaning on his slider and change up more. Just like what I'm seeing from J.P. Sears. And on the other end, Lance Lynn, further velocity decline this season. It was down a little bit last year. Moved another tick down this year. And his expected indicators and his pitch modeling metrics have now climbed into the high fours, even the low fives. So big difference between these two starting pitchers for me. I think J.P. Sears is the far better arm. I like Oakland at plus money in both halves. You're in agreement with me there too. Yeah, I mean, Oakland's been uh, quietly feisty. We joked about them in the first series. Uh, I, I think I made fun of you because you were texting me complaining about their defense uh, because the first couple weeks, the, even the first week was really ugly. Uh, but they've quietly you know, turned it around here and, and been a much more competitive team. Where do you think the Cardinals rank offensively in WRC plus this mm. season? Arenado has not been hitting. Jordan Walker has not been hitting. Wynn and Scott are huge holes. Man, they're probably bottom five pretty comfortably. Yeah, 24th. Uh, and the underlying mat metrics aren't all that much better. So, you know, remember what we said about the Cardinals coming into the season, which was, hey, like, you know, this team better hit because if they don't, their pitching is not going to do the job and they're not hitting. And I don't really think this is a lineup that is looking like it's about to turn a corner. I mean, Arenado doesn't look fully healthy to me. I think that's been a problem. Uh, you know, people who watch the Cardinals more closely than I do have, have said that, you know, his swings have kind of been, he's had some weird pullouts on the swings and he hasn't quite had the, 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 the clean, you know, bat path. It's been weird with him. Uh, he didn't look good in the series that I did watch closely against the Phils. And, you know, there's other questions at the bottom of this lineup because the thing about the Cardinals was always their depth, but with Siani getting starts and Victor Scott getting starts, you know, even with Newt Bar coming back now, like this is just not that good of a lineup to overcome 
the huge advantage that I think the A's have in pitching. And, you know, the biggest problem Sears has had in the past has been homers for sure. But Lynn has just as big, if not an even bigger home run problem at this point in his career. Uh, And yeah, the A's aren't very good offensively either. They're in the bottom five and I don't expect them to really come out of that spot. But even in bullpen situations, I trust the A's more than I trust St. Louis just because of how good Miller's been. So uh, I really don't see a ton of advantages for the Cardinals in this game, as crazy as that sounds, uh, given that Lynn has been such a a, a real gas can and and his stuff continues to decline. uh, Offensively this year, it just hasn't quite turned for the Cardinals. And I'm really, really skeptical uh, that this is a team, you know, we're going to get into futures discussion in a minute. Like I just don't really see anything in this Cardinals uh, offense that's worth, you know, expecting them to really carry. Because remember two years ago when they did win the division, Goldschmidt and Arenado had like career years. Goldschmidt won the MVP. Arenado was elite in the middle of that lineup. Outside of Willis and Contreras right now, like there's not a ton to love in St. Louis. So uh, I think that there's major holes, and I think the Cardinals are a vulnerable favorite here on the road in this one. Yeah, Goldschmidt's not hitting this year. It seemed like he was going to have a revival after going to driveline, getting his bat speed back up, not hitting thus far. Yvonne Herrera and Brendan Donovan have been their two best hitters. And normally you'd say, great, like that means the, the younger core is lifting up the rest of the team, but all the veterans are in hitting. So aside from Contreras, yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about this Cardinals team. I mean, I bet they're one total under, so I'm not personally concerned. But if I was a fan of the Cardinals, I certainly would be concerned. It seems like they're probably past their competitive window and may need to start trading pieces. And maybe they end up being a big seller at the deadline. We talked a lot about which teams are going to trade pitching. Where is the pitching going to come from? Maybe Sonny Gray becomes available at some point. I think he did sign a multi-year deal there, so it might be tough to move off of him. But the Cardinals seemingly passed it for me. Um, Let's move on to some futures talk. Uh, We can talk about the NL Central because it is wide open. I didn't really find actually anything in terms of value that I like want to jump on right now in the central, I probably have angles for all of the other five divisions, but nothing in the central for me. I'm kind of still on the brewers and looking at the math. I tried to find a reason about the pirates. I do like the pirates to get better at some point this season. Once skinny schemes and priester come up and I think their young guys will just continue to get better. But in the same respect, like I still think the Cubs win the division. Every projection still has them between like 25 and 35%. There's really no value there. I think the Brewers remain the value team in the NL Central. Nothing or no reason for me to necessarily add more on them. But I do like the way they're hitting the ball this season. They seem to have an improved offense. And kind of reminds me of the Rays where a couple years ago I was saying, you know, as the pitching phase of the Rays with Glasnow and Snell and all these guys phases out, their position player group seems like it's going to get better. And it certainly has. They haven't even gotten Josh Loback. But I kind of see a similar transformation with the Brewers where – as they sort of moved away from the starting pitching focused team, they now have these offensive pieces that have come up and are filling in holes. And it seems like the best position player group that they've had on a little bit, even Christian Yelich, his metrics are back to like pre-injury levels. So I'm kind of excited about this Brewers offense. I don't know if the pitching staff can sustain itself for the rest of the season. Is there any angles in the NL Central? We may as well stay there since we just talked about the Cardinals that you like. Yeah, I mean, it's a well-constructed lineup in Milwaukee. I mean, there are obviously they're overperforming their underlying metrics right now. Uh, if you look at compare StatCast data to actual results, no team in MLB has been luckier from an ex-WOBA versus actual WOBA perspective than Milwaukee. But there is something to be said for how they constructed the lineup. They have the third lowest swinging strike rate in Major League Baseball. Their called strike whiff rate uh, as a, as an offense is in the top uh, 15. So it's like a very patient group. They don't chase outside of the zone uh, as a lineup. Uh, you know, Cheerio has shown some flashes uh, as a young rookie. You know, they added some real pop, which they needed. But I think they, the thing about the Brewers right now is that Yelich is now going to the injured list potentially. Okay. Uh, his back has flared up. That's the thing that scares me because when you have Contreras, who's playing like an unreal level, you have Hoskins and you have Yelich in the heart of that order. And then you surround them with all of these guys who make a lot of contact. I think it is an above average. It's a clearly above average lineup. But the problem for me with the Brewers, Freddie's amazing, but can the bullpen hold up long enough over the course as we get into June and July and August if their starting rotation is this much of a mix and match kind of hodgepodge group? Because Ashby, you know, you can't really count on him when he comes back into the rotation for much. There's just not enough depth. Like, is Colin Ray, Joe Ross going to be enough to get you through the entire season? 
that's where I kind of have my doubts about Milwaukee. But I, you know, St. Louis to miss the playoffs is as low as minus one forty. I think that's that's really good, uh, given that I expect uh, the, the West and the East to both get at least one wild card. So there's just no no sense for me in, in, in buying St. Louis. I think there's still value in going against them. They've been right around 500 to start the season. I don't really believe in the Cardinals. And I think that the Cubs are interesting because once again, for the second straight year, all the underlying metrics love them. If you look at their, uh, their batted ball profile, it's the best in the division by far. Um, their starting rotation has been pretty solid, like Brown, Wicks, Imanaga. They're getting Tyone back. They're going to get Steele back. Like, it's a pretty good rotation. The bullpen looks a little better this year. They, they they kind of have sorted through their bad relievers from last year and figured out who's actually able to pitch. But now, say, as Suzuki gets hurt, uh, and we're going to talk, I think, Michael Bush in a second, like, how sustainable is that? I have my doubts. Uh, so, overall, I think just – continuing to play against the Cardinals. The Pirates are a fun story, but I think the necessary breakouts needed to have the Pirates take that leap have not happened yet. If you look at O'Neill Cruz, uh, he's been okay. He's still striking out too much, and he's not making up for it with barrels enough. So you look at his profile, it's like solid consolidation as, an, as a solid hitter, but nothing special. Cabrian Hayes, I keep waiting on the Cabrian Hayes breakout. It's not coming. Uh, he's got one barrel this season. So... You know, even though he's hitting really well, he's hitting 270, he's getting on base a lot. He's not giving you power in the middle of that lineup. So I just don't think the Pirates have enough offense to do this, which is, you know, as good as I like Jones and I like Skeens and, and Keller's fine, I don't believe enough in their offense right now to be anything better than average. So uh, I still think the Cubs win this division. I still am playing against the Cardinals. Cardinals about 70% or 60% to make the playoffs for Dakota. I'd wholeheartedly agree or disagree with that. Yeah, at least in fan graphs, they have them closer to 40%. I think that is more on the money. Um, let's move to the other central division and the other surprise team this year, the Kansas City Royals. I want to find a way to play the Royals. I do like this Royals team. They have a Cy Young candidate. They have an MVP candidate. They seem to have made improvements across the board. There's really not that many holes in this lineup. I don't know what they have coming up from a prospect perspective. In order to add to this team, I don't know what they're able to deal away from their prospect pool in order to improve this team in season, but they have a huge range of outcomes. I mean, like bigger than any other team in terms of projections right now, they're as low as 8% and as high as 33% to make the playoffs. They're as low as 3% to win the central and as high as 20%. So if you use the more optimistic projections, there's value on them at plus 260 to make the playoffs value at plus 650 to make the division. I'm a believer. So I tend I'm to believe too. those are more optimistic projections. I kind of like the Guardians a little bit in the Central still just because they're lifting the ball more this year. Uh, you know, the, the Guardians are just never going away. They're super annoying. They're probably going to play 500 baseball. And if the division is bad, they may end up winning it. But I do think the Royals have more upside. Don't love the way the Twins are trending. Uh, nope. Any any interest in Kansas City at this point? Yeah, back on our AL Central preview, I, I love the, the Royals as my upside team. I still love them. I still think they're going to win this division uh, because the Twins do have some concerning, alarming signs, right? Like the pitching, Pablo has not looked as sharp as as you know he did last year, which you know you could probably have expected maybe a step back from Pablo. And the rest of the rotation, you know, Varland has not really stuck consistently, and they're they're relying on a lot of guys uh, outside of Ryan and Lopez that don't have proven track records to the same level. Uh, as even the Royals starting pitchers, if we're going to have that conversation, I mean, which rotation's better right now? I would say, I mean, you could make the case it's Kansas City with Lugo and yeah. Waka, who are like really solid mid to back end starters. And then, you know, uh, Brady Singer, we'll see. I'm still pretty skeptical on him. But, I mean, Reagan is a legitimate ace. So they have depth in their starting rotation. And their lineup, I mean, Vinny, Vinny finally started hitting this week. I was ready to come on this pod and say, like, Vinny Pasquantino has not hit a lick. Michael Garcia has not hit a lick. Both have really good stat cast numbers. Both are about to pop here in the next couple of weeks. Vinny did in the last week, I think he's hit three homers in the last five days, but between the two of them carrying an MVP, you know, burgeoning MVP favorite in, in, in Bobby Witt, like this lineup has a really strong core. We've always liked MJ Melendez. The stat cast data loves this Royals team. They're top five in every uh, hard hit category offensively. You know, you look at their uh, hard hit rate, their average exit velocity is fourth. Their barrel rate is first. Nobody's barreled more balls in all of Major League Baseball than the Royals, more than the Dodgers, more than the Braves, more than the Astros. Uh, and I, I kind of believe in it. 
I, I, you know, because it's always been true that we've always said, Hey, like they have like three dudes who pop on all of these leaderboards, Velazquez, Garcia, uh, really Melendez. And, and then Pasquantino is striking out 9% of his plate appearances and walking 12, um, which is really encouraging for Vinny. So this offense is real. I think they're going to score a lot of runs and I think their pitching is stable enough that I think the underrated discussion and and it's not underrated anymore because everybody's talking about it. How stable is your rotation? How reliable is it? Because this injury issue, if it keeps getting worse, which I think it, you know, it usually peaks around April, but it's still going to, I think it's going to continue to be a problem. How much are you reliant on these top end guy flamethrowers who could easily go down at any moment versus Kansas City even, who, yes, Reagans has injury history, but beyond him, you know, Lugo and Waka don't really throw as hard, so they're more reliable uh, mid, mid-rotation mid guys. Uh, I think, you know, the teams with the depth and pitching are going to be the teams that, that survive almost. Speaking of pitchers who may get injured or are potentially injured, Kevin Gaussman and the Toronto Blue Jays, we both like them to miss the playoffs. I'm not sure when I'm going to enter at this point. There, You can get minus 105 currently. Now, Pakota has them at 70% to make the playoffs. Again, wholeheartedly disagree. Crazy. The three Fangrass projections, though, do have them at 50%. So there's no technical value on this team to miss the playoffs. But when we look at the AL East, when we look at the rest of the American League of the teams who may get squeezed out of the playoff picture, I do think Toronto is on the cusp of getting pushed out. Probably not going to get anything from Alec Manoa this season. He looks awful in the Mariners. Ricky Tiedemann cannot stay healthy in the high minors. Uh, Yariel Rodriguez looked kind of mid in his first major league start. I think he's going to be okay, but I don't think he's going to be anything particularly special. And Gaussman's numbers continue to be extremely concerning. The fastball stuff plus way down the velocity down. I think he may go on the aisle at some point. They are getting Danny Jansen, Eric Swanson, and Jordan Romano back today. So your two best relievers coming back into the fold, but both of those guys dealing with arm injuries, no reason why they can't go on the aisle again. So as I said, I'm probably going to try to time this and maybe get plus money. Maybe they win again today and it moves past plus money, you know, after beating the Yankees. But I do like the G- the Jays to potentially miss the playoffs. And I think we're getting a nice price, getting close to a pick and price at this point. I know you agree with this one too. Yeah, I'm out on the Jays too. I mean, so last season, the question was, what's wrong with the Jays offense? Why aren't they hitting for power anymore? Uh, they were below average in hard hit rate. They were below average in barrel rate. Uh, average exit velocity, they were bottom 10. Uh, You know, we kind of were like, well, the park was weird. They changed the dimensions, uh, but they're in the park again, and the stats are worse. They are bottom two in barrel rate. It's the, uh, the White Sox and the Blue Jays. They are bottom five in hard hit rate. The only teams worse are Cleveland, Chicago, Miami, and Oakland. Uh, And there's just not a ton to love in this lineup unless Vlad like finds that form from 21 and 22. That was what carried the blue Jays offense. And the depth is just, isn't there anymore. Varsho was a good bounce back candidate. He's not even playing anymore because he's been so bad. They're relying on, on guys who just don't have track records at the bottom of, of success. Like the bottom half of that lineup is kind of a hole and the top guys aren't good enough to make up for it. Like Bichette and Vlad are good hitters. But once you get past them, it's just not that much. Springer's shown declined skills this year. So they relied heavily on starting pitcher health and starting pitcher quality last year to make their playoff run. That was what got them that wild card spot. Bassett was really good. Barrios was better. Galsman was elite, like top five Cy Young good. And Kikuchi had a career year. Mm. All of that had to happen for them to get to the playoffs right around 88 wins. So... Why do we think that the Jays are better this year? How are they getting to 89, 90 wins? What's the path? Because I really don't see it. Because- yeah, the path is Houston continuing to fall flat on their face. And they are still projected to win the AL West between 47 and 66% of the time. They should be getting Fromber, Verlander, or Quidi yeah. back at some point. I think the but I think I prefer Texas in that division. Um, you know, the, the projections have Texas behind Houston. But if I'm betting a team right now, it's probably Texas getting low and Jung back somewhere down the line, but also Molly DeGrom Scherzer. Like they have a better lineup to me in general, but also once you actually put Jung back in there. So uh, any thoughts on the AL West? I, I have a couple of teams in the NL to make the playoffs and then we'll get to some uh, player futures. Toronto. No, is even money minus one Oh five. I'm betting that bet it right before we hopped on the show. 
in the West, I mean, how is Seattle not a buy? Because Julio, <laughs> it's kind of crazy how bad Julio has been after we all hyped him for MVP. Uh, Career uh, 612 OPS now in March and April. Yeah. Julio. So that was what I was going to say too, which is he has a 456 OPS. Uh, he's been a historic slow starter. He's 18 to one for AL MVP, which I guess as we transition this right now into the next conversation, the thing about Julio is that the defense always carries his war numbers. So if you look into like, you know, what MVP typically matters, war is not as relevant for MVP as it is for say rookie of the year. But, uh, you know, with the way the park is, he's always going to get a little bit of a pass from the smart voters because his OPS probably won't be as high as uh, some of the guys that play in like Yankee stadium, for example, I just don't know, like, you know, Julio's going to have the month or two that he gets crazy hot. And at that point, you're going to see his war numbers skyrocket up into kind of the top five or six. And in fact, the rest of season projections still have Julio within a full win of, uh, within a win of Bobby Witt. So I think if you're looking for a player to buy low on, it's still Julio for me uh, because you know, he's just had these kind of, it's, it's still only two and a half weeks. It's, it's important to remember that we're talking about two and a half weeks. And if you go back to last year and you find the guys who started really slow, Julio pops up on the board uh, because he was terrible. He had a sub 700 OPS prior to the all-star break last year, was voted an all-star because as an alternate, and then almost won MVP. Uh, you know, he finished in the top five. I shouldn't say almost, almost won the non Otani MVP. Uh, because Seager and then Julio was up there in the top five. So, you know, the Mariners pitching staff still projects as a top five or six unit. They're going to get healthier. They've got nothing from Luis Castillo, another traditionally slow starter. And we have seen this from Seattle two straight years. Remember, they started slow two years ago, started slow last year, and they went on a crazy winning streak in the middle of the summer. Now, last year it faded out. They didn't quite get over the hump into the playoffs. But this year... You know, with Houston struggling, with Texas at 500, nobody's running away with this division while Seattle's languishing at 7 and 10. I think Seattle, uh, if Julio starts to turn this around, is going to make a run at this division. Texas, you know, is a better buy for me than Houston. Hunter Brown's pitching today. He had one of the worst outings you'll see all year against Kansas City. His fastball has been really poor. Uh, and you know, we're expecting Framber to come back to save the Astros, Verlander to come back to save the Astros. I think ultimately when this the, is his, banged up. Exactly. Altuve is not healthy. Uh, he's dealing with a, with a hip injury, um, labrum problem. And even their lineup depth, I have questions about, like, it feels like the, the Astros don't have the top end pitching prospects waiting to come plug the innings anymore. So uh, I think, Houston and Texas are still weights to buy for me in terms of World Series. I want to buy them come playoff time and when we see what their rotation looks like, and maybe we'll be interested then. But I think Seattle is the team to buy in the West, and Julio is the guy. If you're not invested already, uh, MVP odds, because if it's not Bobby Witt Jr. in the American League, I think Julio still, even after a bad two and a half weeks, we're talking about weeks here, he was 10-1 to 1 preseason. He drifted all the way to 18 off of two weeks. Yeah, 18-1, I think, is a buy right now. It might be Juan Soto's year, but I think Julio and Witt remain the plays behind him. The numbers have moved in on Witt, but we're in good shape with that number. Uh, taking a look at the rest of the awards market, there wasn't too much to me that popped out. Joe Ryan's AL Cy Young, still at about 20, 25-1, to 1, I think is interesting. He has a new pitch mix. He's throwing more strikes with his non-fastballs. He's really the one name that kind of popped up to me from a Cy Young perspective. Mookie is a big lead in NL MVP, but Otani at 14 to 1 is showing the best numbers offensively as his career. Obviously, going to get votes if he's anywhere close, but you'd probably need Mookie to get hurt considering he's playing the field, getting all that shortstop wins above replacement. Tough for a DH, a pure DH to win the award. Uh, rookie of the year, Jeter Caminero is floated out to 30 to 1. He actually returned earlier from his quad injury than everybody was expecting. He homered down in the minors yesterday. I think Caminero is going to come up before too long and nobody in the American league has built up any sort of lead aside from Colton Kowser, who is now the co-favorite with Evan Carter. So junior Caminero, when he comes up, if he's still 30 to one, 25 to one, I'm absolutely adding more of that to my card. The one NL rookie that maybe caught my attention was Paul Skeens, but I don't know when the pirates are planning on bringing him up. I thought there was a chance they'd bring him up this week. They're clearly waiting until after the super two deadline. 
And from there, there's no incentive to really bring them up just because if you end up finishing, I believe, top two or top three in rookie of the year, you end up losing a year of service time. So uh, definitely interested in Skeens. I think he's going to be elite when he comes up. But there's a lot of players performing well who are rookies in the National League. Churio's playing great. Michael Bush, as you mentioned, Jackson Merrill was 80 to one in the preseason. He's now fourth in odds. Uh, showed his pitch really well. I'm expecting the homers to come for him at some point and eventually knock him down. But Jared Jones has been phenomenal too. Like there's so many good rookie pitchers in the National League on top of Cam or on top of Churio and Jung Ho Lee. So any other awards, I I'd say Joe Ryan, right? Amongst that whole list of guys I just mentioned, the one that I would probably consider betting. And then Julio also 18 to one for MVP. Those are the two that are probably value bets to me right now. Any actual plays that you're interested from an awards perspective at the moment? You know, so the American League is tricky, right? Because you have to assess role as much as anything because, you know, Jackson Holiday, uh, I'm going to be watching really closely because obviously he's had a poor start to his major league career. But when you have a top prospect like that, you kind of have to play him every day. Like they're not, I don't think there's a, a path where they re demote him as the top guy and, and given, you know, his pedigree. So, unless it's just like so, so bad. So, he's yeah. going to have the runway. Whereas, you know, you're starting to see Kowser get more runway, more, you know, they're not platooning him anymore. They're playing him more every day. But the Kowser thing for me is the strikeout rate. It's still 31%. The swinging strike rate, 14%. Uh, I think ultimately that swing and miss hurts him. And I think he, uh, you know, will cool. And when that, I mean, obviously he's not going to hit, you know, what he's done so far, he's hitting 390, 500 Babbitt. But I think he's he's the kind of guy that still has the skills flaw with the swing and miss that he, and even Bush to a lesser degree, uh, Bush has cut the swing and strike rate a little bit this year, but, uh, you know, Bush was not that heralded of a prospect. So for him to get, tra you know, for the Dodgers, I, I, my friend who's a Cubs fan tweeted uh, the tweet this morning. Do you know who the Cubs gave up for Michael Bush and Yancy Almonte in the preseason? No, I know. Yeah, I know January, they made of Jose Quas for Nelson Velasquez. Was this one worse? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know who these guys are that they got for Bush. Bush was kind of getting pushed here. He was not really in a spot. I mean, it's just hard for me to believe the Dodgers were this wrong. I know they've done it before, but... Uh, Jackson Ferris and Zaire Hope. Mm. And then they designated Brian Servin for assignment. The, the Cubs on January 11th could end up being the trade of the year at this rate, given given what Bush has given them. But yeah, I mean, war is king in the uh, in the rookie of the year race. And, you know, Cowser's already over one war this season. So he's obviously got a huge advantage over the rest of the field. But I think Caminero, the problem for me with Caminero is I don't even trust the Rays, and I don't know what the path is for him to play every day because they don't really think he's a shortstop, and they have a good third baseman in Paredes. Mm -hmm. So Lau gets hurt, uh, and he seems to be hurt all the time, but do they want to play Caminero at second? Uh, I don't know what the long-term solve is there for Tampa, and the problem is then, what if they say, hey, you know, they're getting nothing from DH? Like Harold Ramirez has been pretty poor. Like they, they don't really have a, a, a true slugging DH. So maybe they DH him, but I don't even want that if I'm in, run, in the rookie of the year voting because he's not going to get the defensive metrics war that you get for that. It's really hard to win as a DH. So uh, Caminero for me, if he played for another organization, I would love him right now at 27 to 1. The problem is he's going to come up and he's going to get platooned or he's not going to play every day and they're going to raise him. And I don't really want I – mean, I think the skills are there. I own him in Dynasty because I'm, I'm really high on him. But I just don't really know what the path is to playing every day. Whereas with like even a Jackson Holiday, of course, the odds are much worse. You know you're going to get him to play every day in uh, in that Baltimore offense. And then, you know, Langford has not hit anything for power yet. Rafaela, 18-1. to 1. Zero plate skills, no thanks. Parker Meadows, no power. Like you kind of just start looking down the board. What about Austin Wells? Forty six to one. Yeah, I have some seventy five to one on Austin Wells from before the season, so I'm fine with that. Might have even been higher than that, but yeah, I, if I could find a way to k fade Kowser right now, I would. Like if I could bet Kowser no at minus four hundred, I probably would. Yeah, um, they just have too many corners. Like we've talked about this again and again and again. He's hot right now, which is why he's playing. But they have fifteen guys who could play left field. Kirstad could come up at some point. Stowers. I mean, it, it goes on and on for the Orioles in terms of guys you could stick in left field or in a corner. So, yeah, not interested in Kowser at all. I think Holiday at plus 550 now that he's floated up, maybe worth the bet.
Um, yeah, holiday for me is uh, interesting. In the, in the National League, uh, just kind of to touch on this, sure. no interest in the pitchers for me. Uh, Yamamoto, his fastball is not that good. I watched him start against uh, against San Diego, and and like he hides it well, and like he kind of has the secondaries, but the fastball is pretty flat and like looked very hittable to me. And the Padres did hit it pretty hard; they had a bunch of homers. So Yamamoto, also, will he even be viewed as a rookie? You know, like how will how will the the voters view him? Even with Sh- same thing for Shota, like when you're 30, it's kind of like the the Yoshida thing from last year where. Uh, Amonic is going to have home run problems for sure, even though I think he's he's really good and somebody I bet on a lot this year. Um, Bush, I'm, really, you're buying in like the peak of Bush uh, and even Churio as well. I think Merrill is the uh, interesting case in the National League. There's not enough power in Jung-Hoo Lee. I think Merrill doesn't, hasn't shown elite power at any point, but so good defensively in center. He's He's the youngest of this crew, him and Churio. So, you know, there could be more power blossoming. And then I think the question with Merrill, you know, he's hitting the ball hard. He's just not barreling balls. So could Merrill tap into more power uh, if as he develops further? Really good plate skills, much better than Churio. Churio's got a little bit of chase in him, a little bit of more swing and miss. Merrill, 16% K rate, 11% walk rate, really encouraging from him. But again, like I hate getting it on a guy at 8-1 to one when you could have had him at 25 to one on opening day when they announced he was going to make the plane to uh, Korea. So uh, I'm going to keep waiting on the, on the, the rookie of the year markets. Hopefully Kowser keeps running this hot and we can get better odds on some of the other guys. Cause I really think that 31% plus K rate and the swinging strike rate are going to be a problem for him. Yeah. I, I don't think Kowser ends up taking it down. I don't know if that's a particularly hot take. I just, I think he's off to a hot start and a hot week does not equate to rookie of the year honors, but yeah, I don't really see much bettable in those markets at the moment. Uh, let's wrap up with some final bets for Tuesday's slate. Pretty good futures discussion, though. I'm glad we were able to talk through that. I got a couple of juiced money lines that I laid. The first being the Phillies in the first five innings. <laughs> uh, I like Ranger Suarez, and I think he's showing improved command this season. His walk rate is halved relative to last year. He wasn't hurt, at, or so he wasn't fully healthy at the start of last year. He was coming off a of shoulder inflammation, ended up progressing into the season, but I'm taking his results from two years ago. And they're very similar to what he's doing this year. The pitch modeling metrics, the command, very similar. He also has only walked three batters across his first three starts. The last time he did that, and the only time he did that was in July of 2022. Again, when he was fully healthy. So I think you're seeing the best version of Ranger Suarez. Austin Gomber, another of these litany of arms on the Rockies who are amongst my favorite fade candidates over the past few seasons. It's amazing how they put all these guys on one team. Anthony, I don't know if you heard yesterday, but I said they're basically Patrick Corbin and Dallas Keuchel away from having an entire rotation filled of the guys that we love to bet against more than anybody else. And speaking of Patrick Corbin, going against the Dodgers tonight, but not only that, Nationals have used Hunter Harvey, Finnegan, and Weems three the past four days. They've used Barnes and Floro on consecutive days. And they've also, uh, if Garcia goes tonight, it'll be his third appearance in five days. So literally the entire Nationals bullpen is tired. They need innings from Patrick Corbin tonight, which is terrifying. I like the Dodgers on the money line tonight, up to about minus 250. They should have a huge bullpen advantage. They're going with a bullpen game, but they should have a massive, massive bullpen advantage in the late innings, never mind the fact that Patrick Corbin's starting against them. So Dodgers money line tonight, fine laying it. Any interest uh, on the Dodgers or your Phillies and any other bets for you tonight? Uh, Yeah, you know, the Phillies, Ranger Suarez, the sinker's velocity is up. Uh, the movement on it is better. So that has been a, a noticeable difference. And I thought his last start against Pittsburgh was one of the best of his career, not just because he was pitching the contact well, because he was missing bats. And it was really impressive. Not overpowering, but command really good and, and the sinker better. So that's helped him, especially uh, in getting out lefties where he's been elite, elite. So Rockies do have a lot of lefties in that lineup. Uh, you know, Jones, Blackman, kind of the guys that really scare you, Tolia. Um, so I think that, Suarez should be good tonight, but the Phillies can't score any runs, so that's a different problem. Uh, Phillies, though, number one in uh, expected Woba allowed as a pitching staff. Uh, the Phillies are really interesting. We didn't talk much about the Braves. Uh, we'll, we'll save that maybe for next week because I want to get another week of data on like who the starting rotation is going to be post Strider. Yeah. But yeah, if the Braves keep having a 140 WRC plus, they're going to be a problem. 
they're going to win the division. But if there's any cooling from that lineup, they are now, I think, vulnerable to uh, to see the division. Philly's yeah, 500 in their bottom five offense right now. Harper's not hitting. Nobody's hitting that lineup, and they're still 500. So maybe I'm a homer, but I think the Phils might be interesting for the division. Anyway, my uh, it is Dinger Tuesday. So yeah. I'm going to go with Francisco Lindor, plus 450 to homer against Jared Jones and the Pittsburgh Pirates. Look, Jones is Strider Jr. He throws really hard. He has a great fastball, great slider. His command is not great, so he throws a lot of middle-middle fastballs. And as a result of that, no matter how good you are, you will give up homers. And he fills the zone. And as a result of that, you know, Lindor has been really poor to start the year. They're giving him like a standing, oh, it's City Field. It's like weird. But the underlying stats are fine. Like Lindor is not having a bad start. He's just hitting a lot of balls hard right at people. The thing about Lindor, always been a great fastball hitter. Last two years, great fastball hitter. His X slug against fastballs this year is, is 600. His actual slug is like 415. So he's still hitting the ball hard, still hitting the ball in the air, still driving balls. I think he's going to be fine. We're getting a discount on him. And I know Jones, the market loves Jared Jones now. It's crazy. They opened as a pick in that game. They've actually, Jones has been taking money against because I think the market's gotten kind of crazy on him. But as much as the market likes Jared Jones, he's still going to give up the homers. So I, I think he's a good dinger Tuesday target. Uh, Alonso's odds weren't that good. So I went with Lindor plus 450. Good stuff. Long futures discussion today. Apologies to our producer, David. But if you tune in, thank you. And I hope that you enjoyed us breaking down a little bit of a deeper dive across the league that we haven't had to do in about a month or so. Don't forget to download and follow both Anthony and I on the award-winning free Action Network app. You can find all of our bets for today's slate and other slates in there. Make sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to this podcast. Make sure to check out the Action Network Discord to sweat some live bets with the Action Network experts and fellow gamblers. Sean Corner has been giving out his K-props in there. That's a lot of fun. People enjoy tailing those and sweating those with Sean. And for Anthony Dubundo, I'm Sean Zarillo. Brandon Glasheen was out today. We miss him. We will see him back on Friday with the regular crew. And you will be back with another episode of Payoff Pitch on Friday. Thank you for listening to Action Network's baseball betting podcast presented by MGM. We will see you on Friday morning.